I have six o'clock on my smartphone, so I will call the July 26, 2018 meeting of the City of Bastrop Planning and Zoning Commission to order. Viviana, would you call the roll, please? Debbie Moore. Here. Patrick Connell. Here. Cynthia Meyer. Here. Sue Ann Frege. Here. Richard Gartman. Here. Matt Lassen let us know he was going to be absent. And Cheryl Lee. Present. All right. Thank you very much. Um, citizen comments. Comments will be heard from the audience on any topic not listed on the agenda, not to exceed three minutes in length. To address the commission, please submit a fully completed request card to the commission secretary prior to the beginning of the meeting. In accordance with the Texas Open Meetings Act, if a citizen discusses any item not on the agenda, the commission cannot discuss issues raised or make any decision at this time. Issues may be referred to the city staff for research and possible future action. To address the commission concerning any item on the agenda, please submit a fully completed request card to the commission secretary prior to consideration of that item, and we will call your name when we get to consideration of that item. Madam Secretary, do we have any one who wishes to speak under citizen comments? Not at this time, ma'am. Thank you. Seeing none, we will go on to section three, uh, workshop session part one. Discussion feedback on the rezoning request to commercial mixed use district in the form based code for 2.44 acres at the corner of SH 95 and Chestnut Street regarding the requirements for rezoning consideration and site development requirements from the zoning ordinance. So we will recess the regular meeting of the Planning and Zoning Commission and go into workshop. Good evening. So this is um, kind of just to take a broader overview of the rezoning request for this corner and to get feedback from any neighbors that are present and also talk to the developer who is here. Um, so just to give some background of what we're talking about, we're talking about the, um, this corner on um, the, the intersection of Chestnut and SH95. Uh, to kind of look at the broader uh, overview of zoning in this area, uh, the form-based code area um, goes to um, what, what was originally, I think, the, the, the mid-block back at some point in life, which is now halfway, or through a full block, and now it's a mid-block for this block, goes all the way to the back of that block on the south side. So this whole corner has been zoned since 2015, a commercial mixed use um, in the form-based code. Uh, prior to the form-based code, this whole tract was zoned uh, C2 commercial too. Uh, kind of, we, we did a little bit of research to look in the uh, his, historical records and in our 1991 uh, zoning map, which is the furthest back map I could find, um, it shows that this, the hard, hard corner here was um, zoned commercial at the time. So this, this corner has been zoned for some type of a commercial use since 1991, as was um, actually a lot of the property in this area, which obviously has, some of it has changed over the years, but um, I think it's always been the expectation that this corner would be developed with some sort of a commercial use in the future. Um, with that thought in mind, we have three main commercial districts um, that would be appropriate for this corner. Uh, the first being the commercial mixed use within the form based code, uh, which provides for um, our small to mid-scale commercial, which are retail office, restaurant uses. Um, that are an appropriate transition from our downtown form-based code into uh, the rest of the city along 71 and on SH95. Uh, similarly, you could go with our C1, which is our uh, commercial one light commercial use, uh, which is in our standard zoning code, which is primarily for a heavier retail and a light intensity kind of wholesale commercial use. Um, so kind of your smaller retail, and then you have our C2 uh, commercial to heavy, which is more for your larger scale uh, commercial uses, your, your bigger box stores, your uh, major automotive repair and heavy commercial uses. Uh, looking at our form based code, um, which is the request that, is, uh, that the applicant is now making to go into the commercial mixed use district, uh, these are the appropriate, or uh, these are what are allowed by right within the commercial mixed use district within the form based code. Uh, retail sales and service with or without drive throughs um, also automotive related 
sales establishments are allowed within the CMU district. Uh, when we started really digging into the commercial mixed use character zone and the standards that are required within uh, the form based code, um, some of the, the only requirements really, because this is seen to be a transition between the form based code and our standard code, so it has a few additional requirements that you would not see in our standard code. Uh, one is that the primary entrance shall be oriented towards the sidewalk. So some businesses like to orient the, uh, the front door to their parking lot. So this, the front door does have to be pointed towards the street. Um, they can have the parking between the street and the um, front of the building, but you can't turn, turn the front entrance sideways to the property. Um, some, also, the building facades must be designed with a distinct base, middle, and top to give um, some architectural and visual appeal. Um, from the street view. Um, the For the exterior, hmm? Real quick, just to clarify, since this is a corner lot, they could face either way, correct, and still be in compliance? Yes, they could face um, the 95 or Chestnut Street. Uh, the For the exterior building material requirement, it's the same within all three districts as the commercial mixed use in this area defaults back to our standard zoning code and development standards which for street facing facades does require 100% masonry. Um, there's some other design considerations that they have to um, provide. If, they, if they're providing parking between the front property line and the building, uh, they have to, that parking has to be at least three feet behind the property line and then has to have a three foot street screen between the parking and the street. Um, one other consideration is that any street facing facades have to have a 25% glazing requirement, so at least 25% of the facade has to have windows and doors that are see through. Um, and did, then a, was, a street screen would be? Uh, it, it, it can, it'll either be a solid wall, a three foot solid wall, or a three foot solid hedgerow. It has to be along all the parking areas. So if you have, you know, 50 feet of parking along the street, that entire uh, edge will have to be screened. Uh, just kind of do an over, overview of what our development process is um, going forward. The first step um, when we are looking at a site and someone's asking us what they can do is they need to establish that they have the appropriate zoning. So in this case, the applicant has requested to rezone uh, the entire track to the commercial mixed use district, which allows for fuel sales which is their ultimate go goal, um, as do our C1 and our C2 districts as well. And this is a public review process as uh, it has to go through a public hearing at Planning and Zoning and a public hearing and two readings at City Council to get approved. The next step is, um, in this case, especially the subdivision process, they have to have a buildable lot um, as defined within our subdivision regulations. In this case, they have five individual tracks that will have to go through the subdivision process to create one buildable lot. Uh, through that process, the plotting process, uh, we staff will work with them to review all the necessary street and public utility improvements that will have to be required to serve their lot. So every developer has to make sure they have adequate um, water, wastewater access, and streets um, that will serve what they're doing that, so they have to pay for those improvements. Um, for that lot, the city does not uh, incur that cost. So during the subdivision process is when all of that is reviewed and put into place. Um, this is a public review process. That being said, um, the subdivision regulations are what establishes what we can require from a developer and as long as the developer meets all of those requirements, the planning and zoning and city council are required to approve those subdivision plats. Uh, once they have a lot that they can build upon, the next step is a site development plan. And the site development plan is what um, establishes um, how they're going to lay out all of the private on-site improvements. So that includes their building, all the utilities on how they're going to get from the public line to their building, how they're going to their, their private water lines, um, those also parking, landscaping. Uh, lighting requirements, all of those are included within their um, site design. Uh, the, the, sub, the zoning ordinance has a development san standard section that specifies the, the required setbacks, height limitations, building materials that must be used, the kind of landscaping that has to go in, uh, 
outdoor lighting limitations and the parking ratios and screens that are required. Um, those, all those are reviewed administratively. The applicant has to meet all the requirements of the code. Staff reviews and make sure they meet all of those. If they don't want to meet one of our codes, the um, option they have to go through is a zoning variance and they have to prove why they have a hardship that they cannot meet those requirements and it's a fairly hard process to meet. So um, that's why it's an administrative review. As long as they meet all of those requirements, they can build the site um, to their design within those parameters. And then um, the developer is here and I think he would like to go over some of his Commission, great to see you again. Um, so we're excited to, oh sure, David Meyer. So it's great to, oh I'm with Quick Trip Corporation, uh, project manager for them. So it's great to see you again. Uh, as we last spoke on the last meeting, uh, we went back to the drawing board with Jennifer, went over the CMU ordinances, and uh, we're excited. It looks like we can meet all requested ordinances for the CMU. So we know that was a big concern. It was uh, something the city wanted with CMU. So we have decided to move forward with a request to rezone the entire property to CMU. And so what I did, just to give you uh, a little idea of some of the ordinances of CMU and how we, that we are compliant, just to give an idea. Um, so I have parking spaces. We do meet, we are compliant with parking space ordinances, bicycle parking ordinances. The building setbacks, we are compliant with building setbacks. Uh, building max height, they do, it does allow five story, uh, 60 foot max, we're only at 20 feet, so we are compliant with that. Um, we do have a parking setback that we are compliant with. Uh, the glazing requirement, we went back with our, uh, with our architects and we are able to meet the glazing requirements on our building. Um, and then the gas station canopy screening requirements, we are revising our site plan to, to be compliant with this. Uh, and then same with the parking screen. Um, and then with this, what we did is, uh, we actually met with the neighborhood last night uh, to kind of go over, you know, CMU requirements, see if they had any concerns. And so one of this is we'd actually get with uh, Jennifer as far as screening. We're looking at uh, updating and upgrading our screening along Spring Street since the residents are behind it. So we instead of a three-foot uh, retaining wall, we're asking to do an eight-foot uh, privacy fence with additional shrubs and trees to help block the, uh, the visibility. have to double check the code on what our height limit on fencing is. In some places it's six. I'll have to see sure. if we can get to eight. Okay. Sure. And with that, I'm really here for any questions that you have. I don't have any specific questions, but I'd like to thank you for coming in, hearing what we, what our big concerns were, um, taking your time to meet with the residents. It's a big deal. So, um, so far, everything I've heard from staff is that you kind of took our recommendations and our concerns addressed those and so I don't really have any questions or issues at all at this point. Anyone else? And I would just like to echo what Patrick said. Appreciate your willingness to meet with the neighbors and understand their concerns. Sure. Thank you very much. And then Mike would you like to bring up some additional concerns from our neighborhood meeting? Sure. Perfect. Thank you. Don't talk yourself into problems. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Pardon? With, we will go back now, convene into regular session if there's nothing else on the, uh, the workshop. We'll go to item four, items for individual consideration, 4A. Consider action to approve meeting minutes from the May 31, 2018 Planning and Zoning Commission regular meeting. Motion to approve as is. Motion to approve. Is there a second? Second. A actually, there's some inaccuracies. With, go ahead. Uh, I was present and I'm listed as absent. And I believe it was Diana Rose that was absent during the last meeting. Yes, you're correct. Okay, and the other, um, the other issue is uh, the commission inquired if the city had done a 20-year cost impact analysis for alley maintenance and I believe I included alley and park maintenance. You noted that change? Okay. 
Are there any other amendments, Del additions, deletions, or corrections? Is there a motion to, you want to make a motion to accept as amended? Motion to accept as amended. Is there a second? Second. Motion and second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, say nay. Passes unanimously. As amended, thank you. 4B, public hearing and consider action to recommend approval of an ordinance to rezone 0.398 acres of Bastrop Town Tract Abstract 11 and 2.046 acres of Building Block 12 East Water Street located in the 1800 block of Chestnut Street from C2 Commercial 2 to CMU Commercial Mixed Use in the downtown Bastrop form-based code within the city limits of Bastrop and forward to the next city council meeting. Ms. Bills. Good evening. Um, so the request uh, before you tonight then is to uh, re rezone the three parcels um, to CMU that are currently C2. So the property owner is looking at these full five tracks and extending this, the commercial mixed use zoning and the form based code boundary to encompass the other three lots. Uh, this location, when you look at it on the aerial view, you can see um, there had been some houses here that have uh, been demoed since these aerials were uh, flown. Uh, across the street to the south, you have uh, the Stripes and the Kentucky Fried Chicken restaurant. On the uh, opposite corner, you have a little small strip center. And then on the other corner, you have the uh, Firestone and the Shulman Theater and Bowling Alley. Uh, in, in our historical research, we, we did go back to look to see that this has been um, intended to be as commercial use uh, for uh, almost two decades. And looking at our future land use map, uh, this area is designated as neighborhood commercial, which the commercial mixed use designation fits well within. Uh, within our uh, section 10 and our zoning ordinance, there are four criteria to make changes to the map. Uh, one, to correct any errors, which in this, this is not the case um, in this instance. Uh, to recognize change or changing conditions or circumstances in this particular locality. In this instance, um, they're wishing to develop the five existing tracks into one, which requires one zoning district for all five tracks. Uh, to recognize changes in technology, style, and living, or manner of conducting business, which does not apply. And then also that they must, uh, the change to the property uh, must be in accordance with our approved comprehensive plan, uh, which the CMU is consistent with the future land use designation of neighborhood commercial. Uh, again, just to kind of run through our development process, once this is zoned, we will still have to go through the subdivision process. And then uh, the applicant will have to come through the site development process, which will be reviewed and approved administratively. Additionally, one of the um, big factors in our subdivision requirement is called a traffic impact analysis. So this is required for all developments that are going to, within subdivision and site plans, that are going to create more than 2,000 average daily trips. Um, this is a study that basically looks at the entire area of the traffic that this use will generate and if it's going to create any um, new improvements that need to be made away from their direct site, so other intersections that may be impacted by this increase in traffic flow. Um, this will ha be submitted with the preliminary plat. Uh, additionally, um, both Chestnut and SH95 are TxDOT roads, and any driveways onto those two roads will have to be approved by TxDOT, which they also will require a traffic impact analysis for them that meets their requirements. Um, we've had some preliminary discussions with um, TxDOT, about what the likelihood is of getting a driveway onto either 95 or Chestnut. And they haven't re yet, uh, reviewed this site yet, but in our discussions, they feel that the, at the best what they'll probably be able to approve is it's called a right, I call it a right in, right out turn. Basically traffic that's coming, that's uh, westbound can turn right into the site. And as you're leaving the site, you can turn right to go back out onto Ch Chestnut but you cannot, if you're going eastbound, make a left-hand turn into the site or make a left-hand turn coming out of the site. So you don't have those conflicts of um, people trying to turn against traffic. 
and then there would what well, would I'm sorry what would prevent that or what, what would be up to prevent them from turning left uh, they're, they're actually the way the, the drive will be constructed um, will make the lanes so that you can only turn into them going um, making right-hand turns and there's usually you'll see it's kind of a like a, di a diamond wall, or triangle shape that's... in the middle that keeps you from being able to turn across the other direction uh, for this uh, item, staff received one comment at the front desk that was objecting to the fuel cells use at this location. And, and since the staff report, we received uh, two responses in favor and one with no objection. Uh, staff recommends holding the public hearing and then uh, considering recommendation to uh, approve the amendment to City Council. Thank you. Commission members, do you have any? comments or questions before I ask for comments from the audience. I have one more question. Can you go back to the, um, pick that one. So where the arrows are, is that 95 or? That, this is chestnut. That's chestnut. So 95 thought, is over here. So. And I thought earlier it was stated that the entry would be coming off 95. No, so so when we look at this intersection, so this is what we talked with the text dot and what kind of comes into this consideration. Right now, the way this intersection is structured, you have this dedicated right turn lane. So you have people that do not stop at the traffic light, that just continue to make that turn into um, 95 and then have to immediately narrow down to one lane. So you don't want to introduce another driveway here to have another conflict with that traffic that's not really slowing down at this turn. And there's not a lot of room between this intersection and here to put in an additional driveway. You have more room along here between these two roads to put in an additional driveway. So that's distance, speed, and the traffic flow is what makes those determinations. And that back road, that's a road at the back. Yeah, back so they street. also have access onto Spring Street and then C.P. Johnson Lane. And so I, I would imagine their site plan will have, it, they'll, they'll going to try for this driveway and then another driveway that would ac access off onto Spring Street and then they would use Spring Street to access 95. That was going to be my question. Uh, TIA will be done by the developer, is that yes. correct? And refresh my memory on times and days. Is that going to be, uh, are they going to consider holidays? Are they uh, just thinking of that strip mm -hmm. of road, how it backs all the way up 21? Will yeah. they take that into account when they do the TIA? They, they do their, their traffic counts over a prescribed amount of time that the is best engineering practice and I believe they already did their counts before school ended so they so they captured all the school traffic um, that was going through that intersection and is this a let me make sure I'm clear is, it's tech stocks determination on the driveway yes. not not us city of Bastrop yes okay and does, does it have to go through both or as long as tech stock says it's, it's that's good stock. that's all it matters okay mm -hmm. so we were kind of exempt from handling that portion of it yes okay and to put that in, they're going to have to, currently there's a fairly large retaining wall, so they'll have to re-engineer that slope at that location. The developer will. So all of these improvements will be provided by the developer. Is there any chance of concept drawing that exists yet of what they want to put on that site? Uh, they've had several different ideas working through. I haven't seen the, mo the latest. Okay. So. This is a public hearing, Madam Secretary. Have we had any one registered to speak? Besides from the one that I gave you earlier, no, ma'am. Okay. Um, sure. Come up here and identify, and identify yourself, please. My name is Mike Ward. Um, I work for Quickstrip Corporation. I, I do their acquisition, so I do their site selection, and, and then I work with landowners on, on acquiring uh, real estate. And one of the things, I, w I was sitting out here in the crowd last time we were here, and um, I wanted to just kind of share with you a little bit about Quicktrip because I think that's, that's really important, and we failed to do that in the beginning. Quicktrip's a, a privately held um, convenience store chain. We operate uh, just under 800 stores. Um, we've been around since 1958. It's still privately held. A lot of it's owned um, through an employee e-shop and the guys that work in our stores, you know, get, get company stock in this. And so it's a, it's a great company to work for. We've landed on the Forbes list many years in a row as being one of the best uh, employers in this country. 
and that that's pretty uh, substantial whenever you're a convenience store. Um, we're considered by many convenience store magazines uh, to be an absolute industry leader. Um, and so we, we hold ourselves to a really, really high standard. I, myself, and, and David, we both worked in the stores. We both mopped the floors and cleaned coffee pots, and 99% of employees are promoted from within. And that's David and I can, can explain the whole company you know, all the way from the bottom. And all of our employees can tell those stories. We employ about 20,000 people. Um, we, we've never laid off an employee uh, in the history of the company since 1958. Um, we, every, every store that we open generates about 20 jobs. It, and that's throughout the company. We have our own distribution network. We deliver our own fuel. Everything is kind of um, a function of a quick trip employee. We house our own um, facility support crew. So if we have issues at our stores, we actually have quick trip employees that come to our store and fix our pumps and fix whatever issue uh, we have at the store. We do that to keep the quality you know, of our product really, really high. Quick Trip believes their whole mission statement is to provide an opportunity for employees to grow and succeed. And so if we grow the business, then that gives another manager uh, in, you know, into position you know, at a new store. Um, we're growing into the Austin area. We you know, have multiple stores here. We, we operate our closest markets in the Dallas market. We operate, uh, I think, in the 130, 140 uh, store range throughout Dallas. Um, Quick Trip contributes 5% of all of its profits. Uh, to charity. Quick Trip holds veterans and, and children close to the vest. That's that's the importance. It's United Way and Folds of Honor. Um, and those are just two incredible organizations that uh, if you're not familiar with Folds of Honor, they're, they're uh, um, veterans that were killed um, at war. We They offer uh, scholarships uh, for, for the children of, of soldiers. And so that's a wonderful organization. They're based out of Tulsa, Oklahoma. That's where Quick Trip is based out of. Um, also, we we don't sell. We're a national safe place. So you know, if there's a children or or there's someone needing help, we post a sign out front that that allows uh, children to come get help. And every employee that works in our stores is required to understand safe safe place uh, and and what we do for children. And we know the authorities to get in get a hold of. So it is it is truly a safe place. Um, we have state-of-the-art security systems in all of our stores. Our stores are well lit. Um, we have cameras everywhere. Uh, we do shield uh, all of our light from being uh, emitted. Um, but that is something that, that's very, very important to us. We have, at our corporate office, we actually have a ton of screens, and these guys are 24-7, and they watch all of our stores. And if a store is in an incident, you know, they, they can hear what's going on in the store, and they can see what's going on in the store. So. Um, you know, that, that's something that's really, really important. We provide free drinks to all on-duty law enforcement. It's a great benefit for them. It's a great benefit for us. Um, so I just wanted to get in front of you. I, they also offer college uh, tuition reimbursement. I went through that. I graduated college, never thought I would continue with Quick Trip. But those are the kind of stories that all Quick Trip employees tell. So. I just wanted to kind of share with you a little bit about the zoning that you're approving and the convenience store that's going to be, um, you know, that, that we're proposing uh, to build there is um, we, we truly believe that we're an industry leader. And so I wanted to share that with you guys tonight. Thank so, you. Thanks, sir. Thank you. This is a public hearing. Have we not, we have not had anyone register to speak, right? Ma'am, are you registering to speak? Just in case you come to any other meetings in the future, what we ask you to do is fill out one of these forms before the meeting starts if you do want to speak at a, at a public hearing or on any item so that we can move on down the road. Yeah, and 
I believe council actually have passed to some new rules on that and we'll include that on the agendas in the future. Okay, thank you. Ms. Johnson. Yes, my name is Clady Johnson and I, with the uh, redoing of the uh, zoning, I heard you was talking about to make that, uh, which we have no problem with this corner, the CMU, but I was thinking the other side of Spring Street, the zoning, how is, does it do? You made that CMU, the whole line, is it all commercial? It's commercial mixed use. It's in the form-based code area. We're not making any changes to that. Oh, okay. We get the the, the, uh, the five parcels that will be involved with the uh, convenience store and gas station. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I just yes, needed to understand. Thank okay. You. Um, is it Mona? Yes. I'm sorry. Come. From, is it Williams? Williams. Okay. Yes, my name is Mona Williams. I stand representing. Uh, Can you pull the mic down and the family home can't hear you too well. The families on CP Johnson Lane, and especially my mama, that is on uh, Spring Street, that will be directly across from this Quick Pick store. And my mom is 88 years old, and this is going to ruin the rest of her life. That's all I got to say. Thank you. There's no one else that wishes to be heard. We'll close the public hearing. Um, Ms. Bill just has, so far has this company, is there any reason for us to deny this? Have they met all the regulations, met all the requirements? Yes. There's a, this, um, all we're entertaining at this point is the zoning, uh, the rezoning request from C2 to CMU. And there's no reason to deny no. that. It meets, the, it meets the intent of the comprehensive plan and the future land use plan, and it's consistent with the uh, patterns of development in this area. And Thank you. Just to clarify for everybody, the CMU that's already on the corner, as well as the C2 that's existing, both allow for fuel sales. They just have some different requirements mm -hmm. as far as setbacks and everything else, but the use exists on both zoning properties. Or those five parcels, you can put fuel sales on them as they are now. Yes. It's just because they're the setbacks and everything else are a little different. We're trying to bring those into conformity, right? Yes, yes. Okay. Right now, we would not be able to figure out. We'd have differing setbacks between the two sides uh, that we'd have to be applying. It'll to. be uniform. Yeah. Okay. All right, commissioners, I'll entertain a motion. I have a motion to uh, recommend the approval of CMU for all five parcels or for the three that need to be changed at least. I There's second a motion. motion. A second. Will you call the roll, please? Debbie Moore. Yes. Patrick Connell. Yes. Cynthia Meyer. Yes. Sue Ann Fruge. Yes. Richard Garvin. Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. And uh, right next vote. I thought oh. Cheryl. <laughs> huh? Yes. I'm sorry. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> I'm reading down the road. I'm sorry, Cheryl. <laughs> Keep and, straight. And Keep the next straight. steps for this is that the recommendation will be forwarded to the next city council meeting. Thank so. you. All right. Item 4C, public hearing and consider action to recommend approval of the ordinance for a conditional use permit to allow an additional structure for Bastrop Bible Church on building block 5 east of Water Street, point. 145 acres at 606 Pecan Street, an area zoned in neighborhood in the downtown Bastrop form base code within the city limits of Bastrop and forward to the next city council meeting. Ms. Bills. So this request is to approve a conditional use permit to allow a church use on this uh, lot at 606. Um, currently there is a building or there has been a building there um, that was an existing house that was used um, for I think cl uh, classrooms and uh, other church uses. Uh, they're, they're going to remove that structure and they want to add a new structure that will provide classroom and common space for the church's uh, education and enrichment programs. So associated church uses. 
this is their, what they provided as their conceptual plan, and this is the view to the south, so this is what you would see from the church. Um, this would be the street facing um, side of the, the building. Uh, a CUP is required um, in the downtown form based code uh, for schools, libraries, community and civic facilities, and religious institutions that are within the neighborhood character zone. And this is to ensure that, you're, that the, the style of the building is compatible, size, scale, all that is compatible with the neighborhood, other uses already existing. Um, in this area, you'll see the, um, the main church uh, building is on this corner, um, and it's in the Live Work Zoning District, which allows for a mix of both um, commercial and light commercial and uh, residential uses. And you have a transitional uh, residential use on the other on the other side, and then uh, neighborhood zoning at the top. Uh, from the aerial view, um, here's the the main sanctuary, and there's their existing structure that they'll be removing and replacing. Across the street is uh, an, another church uh, with their lot, and then some additional houses that border the property. Uh, section 33.2 uh, has our conditional use permit regulations, uh, which are also mirrored within our form based code, that the uh, use must be harmonious and compatible with the surrounding existing uses or proposed uses. Um, within this neighborhood, there's already a mix of uses, uh, churches, houses, and then if you go just a little further north, you'll start to hit the, the downtown of Bastrop. Um, the building is proposed, uh, the activities requested by the applicant must be normally associated with permitted uses in the base district. Uh, the building is proposed to be church programming, uh, which are related to the main church, and they're compatible with the neighbor, uh, neighborhood uses as they will be used as a, a secondary use to the primary church structure. Uh, and again, the purpose of the CEP is to ensure that the structure is compatible with the, the residential nature of the area. Uh, number three is that the nature of the use is reasonable. Uh, the request, the requested use will actually remain the same as what is already there if they're just updating uh, with the new building. And the new building's intended to match the character of the neighborhood with, um, as a wood building with uh, porches um, and typical residential uh, shape. Uh, any negative impact on the surrounding area is mitigated. Uh, we have a couple additional criteria, uh, design criteria in our conditions uh, that will make the structure compatible with the neighborhood. And those are on the next slide. So our three main criteria are always that the construction must be in conformance with our regulations, that all permits are acquired, and that the building permit must be applied for and secured within one year of the conditional use permit being granted at City Council. Uh, additionally, we've added that the porch needs to either wrap around or there needs to be a porch on the uh, street uh, facing side of the building. Um, that is actually one of our requirements within the form based code for mo most of our character zones is to have some kind of structural element on the front of the building. And then also the, to have the uh, door, um, a front door um, facing the street. Uh, we, staff has received one comment in favor of the CUP. And we're recommending holding a public hearing and approval of the CUP with the specified conditions. Commissioners, do you have any questions? Uh, have you gotten with the applicant to advise them of the require the additional conditions that you're recommending? Not yet. Okay. But that will they will have to do a site plan um, and do the site plan review. But, and, and what I'm mostly thinking of is that although this is meant to match the neighborhood, it's going to be somewhat of a, like a commercial use, right? Somebody's mm -hmm. going to walk by and realize that hey, I can walk in there. And when we did this for the church off Water Street, mm -hmm. one of the requirements was is that on the street side we have a door that you can actually use so we could walk into just in case somebody needed something or an emergency or something like that. It didn't look it was just a faux door. It was you know a real actual door. And so I'm just looking at the layout they have and it doesn't look like that would work with their current layout. So it may mess with what they have. I just want to make sure that putting a requirement on that they understand whether or not they want to continue forward or go back and kind of look at the drawing board again mm -hmm. before we make a call. So, and the applicant is here. Okay. Commissioners, any other questions? We have one person who wishes to speak, Mr. Mike Rowe. Yeah. 
Yes, I'm Mike Rowe. I'm with Bastrop Bible Church. Uh, we're the applicants, of course, on this project. And the comments that were made about the additional door facing Pecan Street, uh, that will be some, dif some difficulty in doing that because we did want to kind of close off that end of the building so you didn't just walk into it because of security issues, because this is a children's building primarily. So we had the front entrance basically coming off the parking lot, which you know, agrees with facing the church, and the other, other door, the exit door, would be at the other end of the building. So we'll have to look at that if that's going to be required of us. Um, the other thing I just wanted to clarify, the only reason I signed up to, to, to speak, was to, to point out the fact that this will be removing the existing building and basically just using the same footprint uh, with this new building. Yeah, so the other the existing building's already up on getting ready to move out, right? <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> and we're hoping that it does. <laughs> That's an issue. Thank you. Any questions of me? Is this, is this, I'm sorry, I did have one, sorry. Wasn't, wasn't quick enough on the button. Uh, is it, it's just going to be used exclusively for children's stuff? There's no plans in the future to use it for anything else? Well, it's, it's classrooms and other 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 ministry meetings. Okay. You know, it's not just exclusively children. Okay, very good. But we do want to, we're concerned about the security of that end of the building. Right. And does it make sense to you guys that the, the idea behind that door is to make it look, so when you drive down the street, you're not just yeah, looking inside? Yeah, I understand that. Okay. You know, That's why okay. we, we try to put the porches, uh, the, putting the porch around the other end is, is not a problem. We, Prefer not to have a, a door there, though, that, that people can just walk off the street into. Right. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you. Okay. Close the public hearing. I'll entertain a motion. No discussion. I have a motion to uh, forward for approval, as is with the uh, conditions uh, uh, recommended by staff. Second. Motion in a second. Would you call the roll, please? Debbie Moore? Yes. Patrick Connell? Yes. Cynthia Meyer? Yes. Sue Ann Frugge? Yes. Richard Gartman? Yes. Cheryl Lee? Yes. Now it's unanimous. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Item 4D, public hearing and consider action to recommend approval of an ordinance to rezone a portion of 1706 Form Street being a portion of lot 67 within the Nancy Blakely survey, Blakey survey, abstract number 98.70 acres from CMU commercial mixed juice in the downtown Bastrop form base code to MF1 multifamily within the city limits of Bastrop and forward to the next city council meeting. These bills. Good evening. So this is um, a request to approve the rezoning of a 0.7 acre tract within um, a subdivision that's under uh, consideration right now. Um, the current, uh, the owner owns all three lots and this is the current configuration where they have one lot um, that goes all the way back, a little lower lot up front and then a larger lot over here. They're proposing to make their main lot wrap around and then have two smaller lots up front. Uh, in, in doing so, um, this is the existing zoning as they have the CMU zoning goes all the way back to this back property line. Um, it'll, it'll make a split zoning on this new lot. So that's what the request is to rectify is that split zoning so we don't end up with the same situation um, as Quick Trip or any other sites that end up with split zoning designations. Um, so this request will clean up the new lot lines um, as proposed in the subdivision. Uh, looking at the aerial you have, um, this is actually just a block uh, north of the Quick Trip site and it backs, um, they're one, one lot deep for, off of 95 and backs to the cemetery. And they currently have a house um, and uh, on this lot that I think they intend to build some additional um, housing and then um, already have a house here and then leaving this site open for development. Uh, so staff is recommending the request to amend the zoning to MF1 for that area um, and our reasoning why uh, since we already had this big discussion about taking things in and out of the form-based code in this instance um, 
you're you're clean, you're making sure we're not having a split zone lot with the new configuration of lots. Um, the CMU area, while it is getting smaller, it is still at a, a enough of an acreage to um, have development in the CMU district as per the form base code, and it's still going to retain the um, the part that this is an uh, unimproved alley. So it does retain the street frontage for commercial mixed use zoning. And then um, it, and you, we are just moving the portion that is CMU into the MF1 zoning, which is already adjacent. So it's just kind of shifting the zonings around in this area. Any questions of me? Can you explain to me what MF1 zoning in, means? Multifamily one. So it's our lower intensity multifamily zoning district that has, um, of course, now I'm blanking on, I think it's about 12 units per acre is the maximum density on that. Thank you. Any other questions? Has anyone signed to speak? Anyone desire to speak? Okay. If not, we'll close the public hearing. No. Any further discussion? If not, I'll entertain a motion. Motion to forward council as is with uh, staff's recommendation. Second. Motion and second. Please call the roll. Debbie Moore. Yes. Patrick Connell. Yes. Cynthia Meyer. Yes. Sue Ann Fruget. Yes. Richard Gartman. Yes. Cheryl Lee. Yes. <coughs> Thank you. Motion is approved unanimously. Item 4E, approved metal siding as an alternative building material for the Air Fitness Outdoor Studio to be placed in Bob Bryant Park per Chapter 14 Zoning Ordinance Section 37, Exterior Construction Requirement A, the, uh, 2D. So this is actually a, the, a code amendment that you all looked at and processed earlier last year, I guess, or no, it was earlier this year. The year's just going so quickly. Um, uh, to allow the Planning and Zoning Commission to um, consider alternative materials um, in specific instances that make sense um, to not meet our building materials. So in our current code, we don't allow metal siding, uh, which we usually is, is defined as corrugated metal or smooth, um, unfinished metal siding buildings. In this instance, what um, the applicant is, um, the, it's the applicant is the city and the, with in partnership with the YMCA. And what they're looking to, to place in the park is it's called an air fitness outdoor studio. And what it is is a um, basically a, a renovated shipping container that, that contains, <laughs> that contains um, workout equipment that can be uh, pulled out during the day and um, checked out um, for use um, by YMCA members and city um, citizens of the city to um, exercise out in the open air. They're going to install, uh, so they're going to install some um, turf areas that allow for fitness classes and areas to pull the gym equipment out. Um, it's it's meant to be a, huh? So the location of this is in Bob Bryant Park, is the is the where they're proposing to put this. Um, we, we've tried several times to get it somewhere that's not in the floodplain, so that's why we're right here, because that green line is our floodplain. <laughs> so we've been working really hard to not have it in the floodplain where it could get flooded. Um, so they'll be um, along, uh, kind of near the road. They have accessible parking for this use, um, and. But and that's what it, this is the material in question is it's a shipping container with a finished metal paneling that's um, painted and enameled on the outside of the shipping container. So it hides that kind of textured look of the shipping container. And then it'll also be branded with the YMCA logos and have outdoor lighting too as the, the nights get darker earlier so people can exercise outside. So in this instance, staff is. Um, recommending approval of this material because it's it's kind of in that in-between world of it's not really a building but it's large enough to have that kind of consideration of what is the material that the structure is being made out of so and as a park use it's something that needs to be durable and secure when it's not in use just to because i'm curious <laughs> is the y going to own this is the city going to own this who's going to maintain it 
I believe the YMCA is. Mr. Job, you want to answer sure. that? So this is a so this is a grant uh, that we actually uh, the YMC submitted for, and uh, we partnered with them on this. So they have the location. Well, on the land, they'll own the unit. Uh, to answer your question, they but will own the unit. Yes. Okay. We will actually own the land, and, and they'll take care of the turf and maintain everything inside that pod, if you will. But uh, we again, Jennifer talked about the material type, and this was kind of a quasi. We weren't sure what to do with it, so we brought it to you guys so we can blame it on somebody, <laughs> right? And uh, thanks a lot. <laughs> and um, the but the bottom line is, it's it's all the parks are zoned agricultural, so there's a lot of flexible use in there. But we just wanted to bring this to everybody so that. Uh, you got a chance to look at it beforehand. Um, we think it's attractive. We think it'll be fine. It's got some nice turf around it. Uh, it's more than just a pod, but it's a, as you can see, it's an opportunity for fitness for the community. So that's my sales pitch, and I'll let you guys vote whenever you're ready. If not, answer any more questions whenever you need. Jennifer, th so as I'm reading this, though, just to be, we're not approving this project. We're approving the material that it's made out of. Yes. Metal siding. So yes, this use is allowed in the park. This is a very much a park use, exercising, outdoor fitness. It's specifically the material that the uh, so, that the pod is made out of. So is there a way to be more specific about this type of material versus just approving metal siding in general for the whole city as a siding material? Since I know that's kind of what we're trying to get away from. Because the way I look, the way I look at this, if we approve this, then it's it's an approved. No, it only you're only approving it in this instance. So Okay. It would still it to to make this a permanent material type would have to go on to city council as a code amendment. Okay. Just uh, So okay. in this so on a case by case basis you can approve materials I'm, okay. or you can if it's decided that this is good for everyone, promote it as a okay. uh, a plan. I'm just uh, clarifying, make yes. sure we're not yeah. okay. Good deal. So in this instance we feel it's an appropriate material. For the use. Any other questions? This is not something that required notification of any of the neighbors, right? Mm -mm. Okay. All right. No other questions. No other discussion. I'll entertain a motion. Motion to approve. Second. Motion and second. Would you call the roll, please? Debbie Moore. Yes. Patrick Connell. Yes. Cynthia Meyer. Yes. Sue Ann Fruge. Yes. Richard Gartman. Yes. Cheryl Lee. Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. All right, we will once again recess and go into workshop session part two. Uh, item 5A, update and discussion on the draft subdivision ordinance. And Just couldn't stay away. Dave is going to take over in a second. Just could not stay away. Um, I will say one of the other things that um, we've been working on um, internally is, is we're working with an additional consultant. Not that we don't like Dave. Uh, but we also are working with um, Matthew Lewis, and he has a firm that he specializes in really kind of digging down to um, what is already in a community. So one of the things, exercises he's going to start um, with the city is, it's called doing the DNA of downtown, or of, of DNA of your town, to see what standards are already in the city that everyone likes, and see what those metrics are, like how wide are your, on average, how wide are the lots that already exist. How far apart are those street poles? How big are your sidewalks? And then see if that's something we want to replicate throughout our zoning and our subdivision codes. And so I think it'll help as we finish up this process inform some of these finer details that kind of have been brought up. Um, and he's going to begin work here soon. And so, and we'll he'll be coming to um, some of our next meetings to give you guys more info on that. But in the meantime, Dave is going to go over. Uh, the responses since last time. Madam Chair, well, first I want to compliment you all. I saw that I was at the end of the agenda and I figured it would be 9 o'clock before you got to me, but you <laughs> dispatched the early items with uh, yes, sir. Might be 9 o'clock before we get out, but you know. <laughs> what I'd like to do tonight, and I know that you all have some additional items that you want to talk about tonight, but uh, why don't you let me go through what's happened since the 1st of June. Uh, remember, we had a lot of public meetings. We've had a lot of input and in where I am and all of that. And then uh, I know that you all have some additional things you want to talk about. Actually, some of the things I've seen so far are, are probably more appropriate for the zoning ordinance. And so we'll need to have to coordinate 
um, with uh, Mr. Lewis about how that all gets put together. But we can talk about those things, uh, but why don't you let me get through what I have so far. Just as Commission, a reminder. Commissioners, you're okay with that? Go for it. Okay. Just as a reminder, uh, in June we had uh, six meetings with various folks. Uh, met with the utility providers, um, had a public meeting in general where people came, uh, meeting with builders and developers. I spoke at the Board of Realtors and there were some questions that came up during that period. Met with engineers and surveyors. And then uh, I apologize for missing your June PNZ meeting. Uh, Jennifer probably said I was on the beach lounging around. It was a, a long planned vacation. Uh, my original plan was to go to Durango, Colorado, but our campground got burned by the fire, so that's why we ended up at the beach. Uh, we also received a number of uh, written comments. Uh, CB and D engineers, who does a lot of the subdivision work in the city, actually did a very thorough and comprehensive review, gave me lots of good comments, and in fact, I'm still working through a lot of those. You remember Mr. Turnus, the traffic impact guy, uh, made some suggestions. In fact, he completely rewrote the TIA section as a uh, uh, for something to consider, and so I'm kind of wrestling with how and uh, where we'll uh, do that. Uh, Blue Mountain Electric provides a and info, and then another comment from uh, Ms. Uh, Scarnulius. Uh, just to kind of summarize the comments we received from each of those groups and how we addressed them. Uh, at the utility meeting, there was concern made because we talk a lot about public utility easements, and they wanted to remind us that they're not public, they're private. So we wanted to go through, and I, I've already been massaging the language to kind of address some of those concerns. Um, we also talked about uh, a, doing a new process where we'll provide the utilities earlier uh, opportunity for review. The way it's set up now is the applicant comes to the city and then separately they go to see the utility companies and there's no really coordination between the city and the utilities and I think what we're proposing is that when that application comes to the city we will automatically distribute it out to the utilities, ask them to give us their comments, we can then incorporate their comments into what gets presented to you and it's not an after the fact trying to get easements in places um, uh, there, there's also a lot of discussion about where the utilities actually get located in the right-of-way um, and that's a good thing to have and there were lots of suggestions made. That's really more appropriate for the design standards and not in the subdivision ordinance itself, just a reference to that. Um, during the public meeting, most of the comments were for information rather than really suggested changes. People were interested in, you know, what does this affect, what does that affect. Uh, there was a lot of discussion about the impervious cover requirement, and we talked about that. Uh, the impervious cover, if you want to go the impervious cover route, which uh, is something that you certainly could consider doing, it's probably more appropriate in the zoning ordinance. Remember the subdivision, we're splitting up the lots, but we're not really regulate what happens on that lot. It's the zoning ordinance that covers what happens on the lot, and so that would be the appropriate place for an impervious cover requirement. Remember there were some concerns raised about gated communities during the public meeting. You know, that's something that you all really, you might want to reconsider or uh, figure out whether, you know, where you want to go the route that you want to go. Um, and then um, there was one comment just for Grins that there'd be no new subdivisions uh, next to any existing subdivisions allowed in town. And I call that the last one in shut the gate syndrome that, you know, no, nobody else can come in once they're in. Um, we had a, a good meeting with the builders and developers and there were lots of concerns about alleys and street profiles, concerns raised about the 100% maintenance bond requirement. Remember we all had a, lo a long discussion with Wesley about that. Uh, you might want to consider it again and we can talk about some of those issues. Uh, concerns about the maximum cul-de-sac length, concerns about paving designs, uh, TIA requirements. Um, and there was a lot of people, a lot of developers who would just assume you know, pay a fee and move on and not have to worry about the TIA process. And there's really two ways to approach that. One is one we had talked about, the city actually doing all the TIA analysis. And Wesley was kind of going down that road but never got, quite got there. Currently the city doesn't have any in-house capabilities to do that. We have the software but nobody to run it. Um, that's an option that you could continue to have the city work for. Uh, the other approach that is used in some parts of the state is to do a, a traffic impact fee. 
Uh, you all have water and sewer impact fees. You know, what happens is each developer pays a fee based on the required capital improvements that are generated by his or her development. You can do that for traffic as well. Uh, it's much more complicated than water and sewer, but that might be something that you might want to consider. And so that way you wouldn't have to really worry about TIAs. You'd have an overall traffic model. Uh, each development would pay a fee based on the type of use and where they're located. And then that goes into a kitty that builds all the street and intersection improvements. But that's a discussion further down the road, not something that you really need to consider right now. And then, of course, there are still concerns about single loaded street frontages next to creeks and next to parks. Surveyors and engineers had concerns about the 60 foot width trigger for alley loading, and I'll talk about that a little bit more in a, a minute. Concerns about the maximum cul de sac length. Questions about extending the minimum freeboard requirement into 500 year floodplain. I don't know that I heard a lot of opposition, but just concerns about how that might affect development. Uh, concerns about how boundary monu monuments are or set. Uh, we have a requirement in the proposed ordinance that when a subdivision lays out a sub, uh, their, their land, they have to set monuments at each of the corners so that a server could go back and find those corners. And then we don't get into an issue where, well, I think the property line's here and they think the property line's over here. Uh, there, nobody was really upset about doing that. There was some concerns about the type of materials that were specified and the frequency that it was put in. And so I have made some uh, proposed changes there. Um, the current proposed ordinance prohibits any new development in the floodplain, which is a pretty strict standard. It's not completely unusual, but it would not allow anybody to be put at risk by building in the floodplain. Even if you raise up two feet, you're still at some risk. And so there was some pushback to say, well, why don't you allow development in the floodplain if you mitigate it by, and so I put in some language to allow you to build in the floodplain, but you gotta meet two criteria. One is that you gotta show that the flood level never rises. Remember, if you start constraining in the floodplain, that water's gotta go up. And so you have to engineer a way so that that water doesn't go up. And then secondly, you have to account for the valley storage where that water is stored. So if you're filling here, you have to excavate somewhere else to kind of offset that. And we can talk about that in more detail if you want to uh, look at that. Um, concerns about reducing the number of lots before second access is required. A lot of concerns about why we were being more restrictive than the fire code. And so I'll talk about that a little bit more in a second. And then concerns about tree preservation uh, survey requirements. As I mentioned, CBND did a lot, uh, a very thorough review, and in fact, I'm still working through their comments. Uh, most of their editorial comments have been incorporated. Uh, they had concern about the, the two-year two maintenance bond at 100%. They had concern about reducing the fire lane width, uh, fire lane length from 150 feet to 100 feet without connecting it to something. Uh, they the current ordinance says that if we're going to do a private gated community, it's your decision. And they wanted a system where they could appeal it to the council. And so we can talk about that a little bit more. Excuse me a moment. Where can we find this in our packet? The Yes, what you're whipping through. It's, it's probably not in your packet. And why is it not in our packet? Because I probably didn't give it to Jennifer till today. At that uh, we can get you does a, not we, work for us. It, well, um, I, I will accept responsibility, but uh, in the future that won't happen. Uh, but you certainly, we can get you a copy of that um, tonight or tomorrow morning. So. Well, it somewhat limits our ability to be effective because we don't have any uh, baseline for asking you questions. Okay. Well, what, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through all the comments we received, and then I picked out the half a dozen or so major policy issues that I see, and then we can talk about that in a little bit more detail. Or we can go through the ordinance page by page. So. Not to uh, add on, but uh, I do think that, you know, I'm fairly new, and I've been wondering why we don't have the, the slides, because I'm in agreement with her it breaks it down a little bit more, not just for what you're going over, but for the entire meeting versus 
um, you know, this whole big pack. Um, well, I would actually like to recommend, I don't know if this is the appropriate time, but the slides prior to as well, because it does give me a little bit more of an understanding or summary of what we're going to talk about so that I will, I could research and have questions ready. And I will, I'll definitely write down that recommendation. I will say though, as far as the slideshows go, like what Jennifer was presenting earlier, as far as those items go, um, most of those slides get made a day or two before the meeting. So that, that's why you don't get in your packet because your agenda packet, with the way that the timeline works and the execution of the agenda works is that we have to get everything to the city secretary um, the Thursday before the Friday that you get the packet. So last Thursday we had to have everything prepared as far as the, the packet that you got. And then from there the city secretary executes the agenda, the packet, posts it to the website. Then from there we email you. Then thereafter, later on in the week, we prepare the slideshows which is, is why you don't get them in the, it's not that we're trying to withhold information, it's just the, the timing of the way it happens, just to, just to put that out there, if and, that helps. And that would only, that the only thing excluded would be public comments that you receive after the fact. Correct. Because I know we get those sometimes, so yes. those are required to be provided because they're public comments. Absolutely. Those are the only exception. And so, Cheryl, I don't think you were, we're here for our marathon meetings, for most of them anyway, on this. Um, and I think what, what Dave is, is doing here is bringing up some of the things that we have talked about and some of the things that others had concerns about. And we're not going to be asked to vote on anything tonight, just to review them. It's a work session. It's just a work session, so we're not voting on anything tonight. So when you go into more detail, you'll point out what chapter, what section that it, that it refers to, basically, right? Yeah, I'll try. Okay. And what page number? <laughs> Um, David, I like to thanks for putting up the written in comments because I was, fortunately I got to attend a few of those public sessions and I found that actually a lot of comments were weak. There were, I was expecting a lot more in the public session. So I'm glad these additional details came in and got us more, more in depth into the comments and feedback. Uh, and then the comment by uh, CB&D that they thought there would be pushback on our limit of density in the ETJ to not more than one unit per acre. You know, the way it's set up is you'd look at the overall unit per acre, you would be able to cluster it into one part and then leave the rest of it open as a conservation easement. They were suggesting that developers want to have as much out there as possible. They want to build as much. Now, you always got to remember you're hearing from a engineer for a developer. So they're going to tell you from their point of view, remember that my mission was given to create an ordinance that um, created a walkable, sustainable type, uh, try to re replicate um, downtown Bastrop approach or a, a rural atmosphere as opposed to traditional suburbia. Um, they're coming from the point of view that they want to continue suburbia, so because that's the current market model that they're looking for. Special looking. interest group. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Just like the opposite side, the environmental folks uh, have their special interests. And then, of course, you get the big bucks because you got to weigh all those interests together to determine what's best for the public. Uh, as I mentioned, there is a, a written report, a comment to support the requirement for trees. She liked the fact that we were doing tree preservation, and she actually supported the, an increased requirement for parks. Now, we're not proposing an increase over what's in your current ordinance, but she was just suggesting that would be good. As I mentioned, uh, Mr. Turnus uh, recommended moving the TIA to a separate ordinance, which has its pros and cons, and that's what I'm kind of wrestling with. Uh, and he actually proposed a complete rewrite. I think it's based on Georgetown or somebody else's ordinance. So, um, but we can always learn from other folks. Um, we have this current limit of 2,000 vehicles per day as the threshold. Anything that generates more than that requires a TIA. Uh, I had proposed reducing that to 1,000 and to 100 per peak hour. And, you know, my opinion is peak hour is much more important than average daily. I mean, you could have 2,000 vehicles in one hour and nothing for the rest of the day and have a fairly low average daily traffic. But we'd be concerned about that 2,000 vehicles. So um, 
if anything, what I would do is I'd, I'd recommend that we go to a peak hour limit as opposed to an average daily uh, traffic limit. Any uh, proposed lowering the minimum level of service from C to D? I don't know if you remember, level of service is kind of like a grade system. Uh, level of service A is like uh, going down uh, uh, the toll road 130 in the middle of the night. There's nobody there. You can go as fast as you want to go as long as you don't get caught. So no, no impingement. Um, level of service F is bumper to bumper traffic in downtown Austin, or I guess South I-35, they had it shut down completely, that kind of. So level of service C is about average, uh, and we have a requirement that we want the congestion to be no worse than that, which is good because it leaves congestion at a certain level. What's bad about that is it forces you to build a lot of roads to meet that limit. And so there are a lot of folks that argue that a level of service D or something lower may be more appropriate. And from a business person's standpoint, you want people to slow down and come into your business. You don't want them whipping it by as fast as they can. So, you know, in a downtown area, there might be uh, um, advantages to a level of service D. Uh, Blue Bonnet wanted to uh, um, talk about the, the street light color. I actually had pushed back from several people on the uh, street light color. Uh, we uh, had set a maximum of 3,000 K, and, and this involves the light uh, intensity as it affects the reflectance from the sky. So the lower, the, the more uh, night sky you have, uh, the higher uh, gets into the, the bright whites and yellows and stuff like that. So this kind of lowers that. Um, we can talk about that some more if we want. Uh, and then there was, uh, I had recommended galvanized steel poles just from a maintenance standpoint. There was some pushback on that. Uh, and the problem with light poles is it really depends on who's maintaining the street light system. Because if the city is maintaining them, if you allow ornamental poles or some exotic metal or, you know, fancy brass, thing, and then 10 years down the road, somebody runs it down, you may or may not be able to replace it. And so you kind of want to standardize it. But we'll probably come up, kind of massage that as well. We don't want wooden poles, so because those are not sustainable in, in the long run. Uh, I did, even though I missed your meeting, I did listen to it. So I heard some of the comments that you raised last month. Uh, you had, uh, there was a concern raised for, from the audience about the increased costs and unintended consequences. Uh, again, remember the goal that I had was not to lower costs to, to developers. If, if our goal is to lower costs, we'd have a completely different ordinance. But having said that, you remember that's something you need to balance. Uh, and then concerns raised about alleys, street light spacing, uh, maximum cul-de-sac length, threshold for two points. Uh, maintenance bonds, TIA, uh, you see that there's some common themes that are kind of running through a lot of these comments. Uh, there was a question about the flex, you know, can the standards be flexible? You know, that's good in theory, but, you know, in actual practice, if you allow flexibility, developers are going to use to go the cheapest way. And that, so, you know, nobody's going to do anything other than the absolute minimum that they're required to do. So, uh, unless they just want to, invest more to have a, a higher uh, cost on their project. So uh, just to kind of uh, summarize some of the issues that I've heard so far, one is the threshold on requiring alleys, and we've currently got it set that any area with lot widths less than 60 feet in width would require rear uh, access alleys so that you wouldn't have the garage dominated uh, or snout houses uh, how you want. And so that was the goal is to reduce garage dominated streetscapes, encourage pedestrian home interactions, um, improve curb appeal. You know, you're selling your house and all you see is a garage door. You know, that doesn't have as high value as having a nice front entryway and the sustainability of the residential neighborhood. You know, garage dominated uh, residential areas might be okay at the very beginning, but as over time and they're not maintained, uh, they tend to go down faster than a normal residential area. Now, why 60 feet? Now, my rationale was a standard two-car garage is about 24, 25 foot in width. 
if you said, well, we wanted to have the house be at least as wide as the garage, we'd have another 25 feet. So you have a 50 foot front elevation of the house and then you got a five foot side yard on either side. That's how you come up with the 60 feet. That's nothing magic about that. Uh, you know, if you went down to 55 or 50 foot wide lots, I don't think the world's going to come to an end. If you go much narrower than 50, I think you get back into the problem of having, you know, a street full of garage doors. Um, so we might want to talk about that. Uh, I also mentioned that the, uh, there's another way to approach this, and you want to uh, uh, use this with uh, Mr. Lewis, is you might have a requirement in your zoning ordinance to require that the garage door be set back a minimum distance from the front plane of the house. So instead of pushing the garage out front like they normally do, require that it be five foot back or so from the front face of the house. Uh, so that's another approach, but that would be more appropriate to the zoning. Probably be appropriate to get some input or comments on that issue. I feel like we kicked this around at our last meeting. I feel like 50 feet is something I thought we all kind of kicked around as like a middle ground. Am I misremembering? There's actually this whole 60 foot thing. Uh, since it was brought up, I've started doing some digging and you know, we're looking at what's the front of the house look like? Is there a garage? We have to go to alley. And a friend of mine brought up another one is, how much parking do you have in the neighborhood? And if you're looking at a 60 foot lot, all of a sudden you've got 20 feet gone for your driveway. You've got another 20 feet for you to, somebody to park a car on the street. Well, there's 40 feet gone. Okay, 60, okay, I can get one more. So I've got two on-street parkings available to me. We start shrinking that down, all of a sudden on-street parking starts disappearing. And you just go through any of our, our neighborhoods today, and we use on-street parking a lot in this town. So I think that's something we need to consider. And it's another factor that feeds into this. Not only what does it look like, but how much on-street parking are you providing as well. Um, you yeah, the, there's a, the, the, the front of the house, the layouts, there's so many different options out there. I don't know how we can come up with something that, that addresses what we want to have, but yet gives the developer enough flexibility they can come up with some unique designs. I think like David said, we're going to have to kind of meet in the middle here and then know just in the back of our minds that we're going to have to pick this up on the on the zoning, you know, rewrite yeah. as well and, and flex away. I think we can only do so much here in the uh, in the subdivision. But I, I look at it like this. If it's 50 feet, we're shaving 10 off. But if you get shorter than that, then you gain some because you lose the driveway. Yeah. The parking's going to be in the back. So you, you, you kind of recapture some of that, that um, that street parking, if you get narrower than that 50. But I just remember us kind of talking about it. And I know we had a, a comment or two from, from the developer and, and that 50, I just remember 50 being like somewhere where we said, okay, maybe 60 is a little too big, but no less than 50, that's just way too narrow. Yeah, and, and we know the developers, and if we let them build 20 foot wide lots, they would. And they just, you know, pack them in there as much as they can. So it, it kind of, we have to find a, a number that is comfortable with us and then Mr. Developer, have fun, work around that. Um, I, David, you've been doing this a long time, but it's you know, there's no magic bullet for any of this. Although I will say that our current uh, SF7 zoning does require 65 foot width, 60 foot width minimum lot size uh, to develop on currently everywhere else in the city. So, But well, we do have a number of PD lots that are narrower than that. That's yes. true, we do. I just want us to all stay focused also on what the goal, like you said, Dave, is because if we start changing too many things, we've changed our whole uh, vision of what we want. So I know we don't want cookie cutter subdivisions, like yeah. you go outside of Austin, you see that everywhere. So I do think it's very important to stay true to what we want the town and the vision was, but also to try to incorporate smart ideas from all voices. Dave, early on, I think it was in your January presentation, you had a foil that said, here's the objectives we're trying to accomplish, you know, pedestrian, bike friendly, um, neighborhood type of feelings. I think maybe we need to go back and look at that again, put it back in front of us. So we go, this is where we need to go. And, and you brought up another point. There's things we may find in here that don't belong here. 
they belong over in the building um, ordinance or the zoning ordinance or the sign ordinance. Um, but we run across them here. Um, it'd be nice if we could do all of them parallel, but we don't have an unlimited resource there. Well, if, if as you recall, on the first page of the draft ordinance at the very top are all the other changes to other ordinances that I'm proposing, that yeah. things that I've taken out of the subdivision ordinance or need to be addressed because of it. But Madam Chair, do we have a, you don't have to vote, but do we have a sense or a consensus of a number? It, it, is there a standard anywhere that uses average lot width? Like if, like if we want to say that the average lot width across the, the whole community had to be no more, I'm sorry, no less than this, and no lot could be less than this. Is that a standard that exists anywhere? Well, in some cases, in a PD ordinance, you might do that. You wouldn't want to do that citywide, but within a zoning district, you know. Okay, that's, so it's a zoning, okay. Yeah. I, I, I would just like to know, have a better sense of what the gentleman who was coming on board to get the DNA of the city just what he is going to do. Is he going to do things that could have public input on 60 or 50 or alleys or street widths or are we going to go through and spend hours again going through this ordinance only to have a demonstration and people come back and say, oh, we don't want 75% of what you've done. I mean, I love you and all that, and you've done an amazing job, but if what we're looking at here is going to be changed a lot by what's coming down the pike, I don't know that that's the best use of our time. I don't know that, well, I don't know exactly what he's going to be doing. I've heard in general what he's going to be doing. Uh, I really don't know that the direction that we've been going in this ordinance is going to be counter to what he's been doing. Other I don't than, know. I don't know that. It, I mean, other specific other details. things. So, details. Yes. Yeah, so, and it may be a few months before we get to that point. A few months. Yeah. Uh, did Jennifer skip town on us? Oh, okay. <laughs> Could you ask? Tell her we have some questions for her, please. Yeah, I don't know what, my understanding is that his first task is to do this DNA analysis to determine what basically the character or, you know, the, the bones of the community so that you could build the ordinance, the zoning ordinance on top of that. But what all that entails, I'm not exactly sure. The zoning ordinance? or the Pri Primarily the zoning ordinance. And how much is, I'll ask Jennifer. Talk about the DNA analysis. <laughs> so currently um, we have contracted Matt, Matt Lewis to do, it's called the DNA of, of Bastrop is what we're doing. And he actually, th I think he started kind of going through our codes and he's looking at, um, and a lot of this is really going to feed into the zoning ordinance is what this will feed into. But what he, he's basically looking at numerically coding all of um, our current standards that you see downtown. So because I think most people will agree we like downtown. Um, it functions well. It's, it, you know, on your price per square foot, it's your more, it holds its value over the long term. So he's looking at how far apart are our street lights? What are the um, different lot widths? You know, what are the different actual building types and lot and building types that go in? Where do we have street furniture like uh, our square, our sidewalks, where are our benches? All of those kind of aspects that go into the downtown and into the residential area um, to, to get kind of that feel of this is what we already have, what is it that we already like about our town, and how do we replicate the elements that we like in other parts of town. So that's, that's, his, that's his step one, that's where he's at right now. And then I think in the future then we're going to look at the zoning ordinance in that context. So I'd like to continue going through all the stuff that Dave's put together, but would it then make sense to table this after tonight, table this discuss, entire discussion until he's done with his first part of his project? And he'll actually be on our tour on Saturday, so he'll be able to introduce some of these ideas and give you a little bit more information on all of that on Saturday. I had hoped he'd be here tonight. Just, What's the schedule for his first phase? The first phase? The DNA. 
Um, the first phase, I think, is in the, in the, for, in the, over the next 30 days for, to have a report it, on the DNA of downtown so, or of, of town. Just a question I have, mm -hmm. maybe a stupid question. Do we have an open meetings issue with having him talk to us about stuff and then discussing it during that tour? No. We've already posted that meeting, and um, it's oh, nothing the, we're going to take action on. So. Okay. And what we also uh, we also sent out in um, the one of the many emails over this week um, that we're having a special meeting on, on August fifteenth to talk about some of these things as well. So all of this will start to come together over this that's month. That's great, and this, every, mm -hmm. every bit of input that we can get is great. I do think we have put in a lot of hours with Dave and have worked mm -hmm. on all of these points too. So. It, this will be good input for us to have, but we did start with the existing subdivision ordinance mm -hmm. and work from that. So we all have to remember how far we've come from that. So I, I don't want us to lose sight also of the work that we put into this, quite a few hours, and a lot of thought to what we really want this town you know, to, to be. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think it's great though that we have him too. Okay. Yeah, and, and, and again, a lot of what he's looking at will go into the zoning ordinance, which will work with the subdivision ordinance, but most of what we're talking about in here is our drainage and streets and all those infrastructure things that go into subdivisions. Additionally, another, um, another thing that um, the Home Builders Association, along with some of the engineers who work in town, they're actually working on kind of breaking down the, what is proposed in the code versus what is in the code today to try to put some numerical values to, well, this is how much it costs us to build a street today. Under your new codes, it's going to cost this much to, how, to do some kind of fiscal um, impact analysis. Um, from their side, so I th that is that's coming forward in the next month or so. They're still working on that. We've been talking with them, um, so they're working on that as well. So we're we're getting some. I think the idea is we're getting this information to fine tune the the questions we've had, the very specific questions we've had, not to entirely start over, but to address the specific concerns that we've had out of the public meetings. I noticed that the. Um in the materials for the volunteer fair that they had, mm -hmm. that the criteria for being on PNC was to commit 30 hours a month to PNC. And when we multiply out, if we were doing that, mm -hmm. 30 hours times how many months have we been working on this? How many months have we been working on this? Uh, this is 11, 11 months. Well, I mean, have we been working on it when it finally came to us? Not not the outlines, but the meat. No, November is when I first presented to you. Mm -hmm. Okay, but not in writing. That's right. <laughs> in outline, I don't before. count it before we had something I think since in January. Really, January. January. Yeah. Okay. It, it, it was our February meeting where Dave gave us our first chance to let our eyeballs glass over. So I think I think that everyone has thinly veiled frustration in the fact that we have spent 30 times how many months? Well, I don't know that, so the 30 hours was the estimate for going forward to start work on our zoning ordinance. Right, because, well, I'm actually so being we're facetious. Trying to, yeah, I know. <laughs> okay, so I guess my question is, we're still back to uh, propose probably excellent recommendations on tweaking it again. But we can't work on it. I mean, I would have loved to have had it in a packet so I could have tried to integrate it in my thought process so this would have been a productive meeting. Instead, it's going to be I, I think, more thumb twiddling. I think either way, whether we have the, excuse me, whether we have the info or not, knowing what we know now about our new consultant, it makes sense to go through the rest of this touch on it, but it makes no sense for us to have a discussion about any of it until he's done with his first phase. Because although most of the stuff he's going to do will play into zoning, we need to consider zoning while we're doing this because how wide our lots are belongs in the subdivision ordinance. It does not belong in the zoning ordinance, but they're going to play on each other. So it makes no sense for us to really discuss this anymore until he kind of comes back and says, look, this is what y'all have. This is how I'm looking at it. This is kind of what I'm proposing roughly. And then we kind of start looking at yeah. you know stuff together. To, to a point, I mean, really, some of this gets into more of your traffic congestion and your street layout. So 
which is your subdivision sections. It's, you know, once you have a certain width, you need to start considering alternative. I, I don't disagree, access. but, so, but yeah, right so. now we have no idea what our downtown area looks like because mm -hmm. he hasn't gone through and done it yet. We know what, you know, Riverside Grove and Hunter's Crossing look like because they're, you know, planned development and we know that those are, what are they, 50 foot with lots. 50, 60, 70 in Pecan Park. They have, and then all the way down to, I believe, 40 in the Right, so we have, a, we have a variety. So trying to pick mm -hmm. a number without having an idea of kind of what our downtown area looks like just doesn't make sense to me. I think it would be good to still go through the slides only because um, when we do our tour, um, we, we have a better understanding of what the issues are. I think it would be good if we get this packet for the, um, probably tomorrow <laughs> or tonight to print it out because while, you know, he's going to be giving recommendations and we can correlate with his recommendations with what we already have in place to help us kind of process the information a little bit better. So, you know, to not further prolong tonight, I say we let them go ahead and finish out the slides and then hopefully get a packet. And actually what I'm seeing is the result of the hearings, which it would have been very productive had they had the hearings before it was given to us. And that way we would have had this information initially. Call you, you. Yes, the public, the public meetings. Meeting. The public, yes. I'm sorry. And that was doing congressional the hearings here. Yeah. The public <laughs> meetings. <laughs> yes. Because all of this input, of course, we can weigh in and plug in and discuss. But we didn't have it. We're just getting it piecemeal. We didn't get the comments. Until That's what I'm saying. Well, you yeah. can't they, get the comments they, before you have the meetings. <laughs> you, you can get the comments on what we were presented months ago. Because we're looking at continuing to, it, it's an evolving situation. Well, these but specific anyway. comments are from the meetings last month, the public meetings last right. month. That's right. And saying yeah. if the public meetings last month had been, if we had not started dealing with this until after the public meetings and they were looking at the original piece, we would have had far greater direction in the changes that we were going to propose. I mean, I'm not splitting hairs. It just seems horribly inefficient, frustratingly inefficient. And if we had had a, a, a fully functioning planning department, I think probably that would have done, would have happened. But they're severely shorthanded at the moment, and at times I'm surprised they can accomplish what they accomplish. Uh, it doesn't ease my frustration either, but I'm just saying that I understand a lot of what's going on. Um, so I do understand, I, I would like to go through, I agree with Cheryl, to go ahead and finish what, what Dave has brought to us. And I'm not going to make decisions tonight. Um, not going to vote on anything tonight. But just go ahead and hear what he has to say. Okay. And not to belabor it, but until they had something to look at, which they were provided in May, they wouldn't have had anything to comment on. It's, it's hard. To, if you ask for people for comments without a proposal in front of them, you often don't get much. I'm asking you when we received it. We didn't receive it in May. We received it months we, before. But it's been changed quite a bit in response to your I know. Comments. We could have made the changes, comprehensive changes, instead of piecemeal changes. I, I, anyway, I, I, think, we're, I think we're belaboring a point. Let's go ahead and do something. Let's go forward with your comments. Yeah, and as far as schedule, I don't think that, that necessarily tabling it. So we're, it's going to be another couple of months before we're ready to appoint to adopt this. And by then, I think you'll have that DNA report. So hopefully it'll all fall together without just stopping in midstream. But again, is there any further suggestion or consensus on what? if what? the commission remember? Is it with 50 or 60? I don't recall. 60. I know we said 60, and then I remember the developer was pushing for 50. I remember. I think they wanted 40 is yeah. what they were wanting. And we kind of said 50, and Kyle's, uh, just as a local area, Kyle's got a 50-foot limit on theirs. So anything that's less than 50 has to be alley loaded. Actually, I, I talked to the planner and Kyle. They have never had a 50 yet. Right, I'm saying what their what their zoning is, is or what mm -hmm. their subdivision ordinance is, is, is a 50-foot 50 50. minimum. Okay, so that's, anything less than 50 That's is. where we're leaning. So 50? Mm-hmm. For today. 
<laughs> and again, once the ordinance is adopted, it can be amended. That's right. So, um, there was still a lot of concern about development in the floodplain. Um, and as you recall, uh, what we have in our current ordinance would be to limit uh, any development within the 100-year and then require the two foot above and the 500 year out there. Uh, as I mentioned, there was some pushback about allowing development within the floodplain, provided it be raised to two foot above, but to do that also require there be no rise and there be compensating storage. That might be a little what bit. What was that? Say that again? That <laughs> if we allow people to build in the floodplain, right. they're going to be filling in the floodplain. They would have to show that by filling in the floodplain, they're not raising the flood level any. Okay. And that they would also have to offset the amount of fill they put in by excavating somewhere else. Somewhere else. Somewhere else. Yeah. So my opinion, with our city and what we experience, we should maintain the no development in the flood plain. My opinion only, we've we've had unprecedented rains and other natural disasters that affect that. And, I, and you know, even, you know, We've had, what, several 500-year floods in the last few years and, and, and whatnot. So to me, not hating on the engineers, but just for an engineer to go, oh, I've, I've done the calculations and we're good, is, is great until we get that 500-year flood for the third time in, in the last few years. And until you're sitting in a house that has five feet of water. Right. But so, and I can think of a number of people on the other side of 71 uh, in Unit 5 who would prefer not to have their house in that location at all because it sits in a floodplain. So my preference or my recommendation would be to stick with that and have there be no exceptions whatsoever to that. On, on this, the tour Saturday, one of the items of these new apartments in Hunter's Crossing, when you go by there, look very carefully at the foundations and the tons of cubic yards of backfill that have been brought in to raise the foundations. Because those, the water ponds are in the 100-year floodplain. Yeah, I think this is a critical issue, one of, one of the most critical, and I, I really don't I agree with Patrick. I don't think uh, compromising on this issue would benefit the city of Bastrop at all and the citizens. I would also say that the only people you would probably find that are in favor of this would be the developers and that, that in general the citizens and everybody else would be would say no, and it's our job to look out for them, and that's where, that's where my head's at. Okay. And even monitoring something like that. You know, how do you monitor... Did you fill and were you, ex you know? Well, the engineers make money on that because they would have to do that. <laughs> Trust me? Right. Uh -uh. No. Um, there was concern about we have a requirement that if you have a development or a street uh, with more than tw uh, 20 houses, you have to have a second point of access. There was some pushback to say, well, the fire code allows up to 30 houses. Why not allow 30 houses? It's, this is this is one of those items. Go ask our fire marshal which one does he want, and whatever he says, that's what we put in there, because it's his people, his equipment that have got to deal with that situation. And if he thinks we need it to twenty, fine. If if the national fire code says thirty, okay, so we're going to do at least thirty. But if our fire department feels that just because the way they're structured, their equipment, their personnel, they need twenty, whatever he says, that's what we'll put in there. Does the fire code have a different rate? Different minimums based on your ISO rating? Does it change? No. So it's just the standard regardless of ISO rating no. then? Okay. Is everybody cool with Richard's recommendation? So it, with, yeah. it, with it not being based on ISO ratings, I would agree that, that it would be, it would, if, if he wants to stick with the 20, great. If he's like 10, eh, I might have to, you know, they always want, they're always going to want smaller and, and whatnot. We got to kind of bounce there, but I would, I would agree going to them and kind of see what they think would be ideal is great. Okay. Now, I don't know if you get anything extra for going to 20, but I, that's not a standard requirement. Most of the ISO is based on manpower, water supply, right. those kinds of, what codes you've adopted. Right. Uh, TIA, um, does anybody have any strong feelings about? It, I, I read the, what Joe said, and then I read what we have, and Joe's is just easier to read. It yeah. covers the same subject, right. but it's just easier to read. So. Well, well, I, I, as to where, where it belongs, I have no idea. I, I'm a fan of your of your moving to a strictly peak hour number versus okay. an average daily because at the at the end of the day, when I'm driving through town, 
I don't care what traffic's like on average during the day. I care what it's like when I'm trying to get home after the end, you know, after right. I get on my way home from work or when I'm trying to leave for work. Uh, whether or not there's no other traffic, it, you know, the rest of the day is, is meaningless to me. So um, moving to a peak hour number um, is probably ideal because it, it, it picks the worst time and we go based on that so that that worst time is mitigated. Uh, that's my thought. If we took the TIA out of the subdivision ordinance, where would we put it? Would it be over in zoning or would it have its own separate code? It would probably be under the construction standards or you know, I'm not exactly sure where in your code it would be. Actually, there would still be a paragraph or two in the subdivision ordinance referring to the right. TIA. They would have the trigger. Yeah, and it may be that a lot of the TIA just ends up in the design standards rather than actually in the code. It's the code is what's just the what's kicking it in. So, okay, then I think that's a good point. Is maybe just look at the trigger there and then right. put the details of it over right. in the design standard. Yeah, you know, the ordinance for the most part should be what you should do, not how you do it. Yeah, right. yeah, that's oh. yeah, that's a perfect argument. Yeah, Let, let's tell them. Here's what we want you to have at the end of the day. You hire the engineers and the technical okay. people to go figure out how you're going to get there. Okay. Maximum call to sack length. Your current ordinance is 600 feet because that's the old FHA standard. Uh, we had proposed 200 feet. Again, it's nothing magic. Uh, shorter is better from a walkability standpoint. Um, Did you uh, get much comments about that? Yeah, there was a there concern. Was some, there was some pushback on that. And to some extent, it may be moot because they may not be realizing that the block perimeter is going to limit how long your cul-de-sac is going to be anyway, but but if you want to move on this, uh, it doesn't bother me a whole lot. Well, what was the main concern of, that they had about the cul-de-sacs? Just the length? Lack of space to develop more lots. Yeah, we, we, we had That's, a concern yeah. about the length. Um, no, 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 I mean uh, the people that raised concerns, the developers that raised concerns, because there, there was an issue I thought I saw with from the developers. Well, the developer gets more calm traffic lots. You know, lots on a cul-de-sac are more desirable than lots on a street that has three traffic on it. So the more that they can get on that cul-de-sac is a help. Not to hate on our developer partners, but keep in mind that, that any change they want is going to make it cheaper to build, more efficient, stuff like that. So a longer cul-de-sac where you don't have as much crossroad, you know, connections allows them to have more lots, meaning for every acre they buy, they could put more houses up and it's more money. If, so, you'd, if you'd like to get an idea what a 200-foot cul-de-sac looks like, go over to Hunter's Crossing when you turn off 304, turn first set of streets on the left, there's two 200-foot cul-de-sacs there. So you can look at it and you can get an idea of what that feels like. So by the 200 by, is, by, it makes for a much nicer, more enjoyable uh, community to live in you know, drive and everything else. So uh, while I can understand their concern, right. I think it's better for everybody, or at least for the citizens, people that are going to live there, to, to have those to be shorter and stick with the 200 proposed. That's, that's my thought. Yeah. Everybody okay with that? Okay. Street lights. I'd mentioned the color issue. Uh, we currently have in there uh, 3,000K, and I realize that's a little bit esoteric, but that's basically the, the hue of the light that comes off the, the, the luminaire. Uh, we propose 3,000. Th th 3, uh, that comes from the night sky folks. They have specifically recommended 3,000. That's where that number came from. The utilities have requested 4,000 plus, but I think they will live with whatever we um, provide. Yeah, the higher, the higher the number goes, the more white get. Uh, 3,000 is close to the color of lights we've got out here in front of us. So they're, they're, they want something a little more towards the white spectrum. I think the hot, the bright whites are like seven or 8,000. Is the benefit to them that they can space them out more? No, the only benefit to this is the reduction of the reflectance of the night sky so that you can see the stars. Right, but, but what, why would they want 4,000 versus 3,000? I think probably more, I don't know if there's any cost efficiency because of, you know, different kinds of, you know, high pressure sodium or uh, because these are LEDs anyway. Um, so it, again, it becomes, a, it becomes a 
it makes sense that it would be a, that this is what we stock usually. Yeah. These would be more specialty, yeah. and so uh, sorry, yeah. we we have not yeah, yeah, Actually, Richard. if you look at Hunter, go over to Hunter's Crossing, the original stuff is the old high pressure sodiums. The newer developments, ones that went in the last three or four years, are the uh, seven eight thousand LED K LED lights. So you can see the big oh, difference. Oh, like the ones in Stone Park. Yeah, uh, no, over in uh, Hunter's Crossing. I think the Comfort yeah, the, the newest set of, in there. They're, these are the LEDs. Um, the bright whites, um, the brighter you get into the white, the higher the energy efficiency are. You move down towards the amber, it drops off a little. But going to LEDs from high pressure sodium, you're still looking at like a four or five x cost savings. I mean, the cost savings in energy is just astronomical. This is one of those things where, like, when the advertiser posted a thing about digital billboards, people went nuts about how, you know, no bright lights and we like our dark sky and stuff like that. So this just seems, based on citizen comments on other topics that relate to this, that the, the 3,000 should be just fine. There's no need to go go up to that. Yeah. Not without a really good reason, which it doesn't sound like they've provided. So. so related to that is how many lights should there be out there? Uh, your current ordinance says whatever BPNL says, <laughs> and uh, almost literally that's what the ordinance says. <laughs> um, I had put in, uh, and I'll talk about residential streets just because that's the lower end, uh, a 200 foot spacing, and that's based primarily on uh, public safety and uh, light continuity. Uh, you know, to provide adequate lighting so someone feels safe walking at night and that you don't end up with a bright spot and a dark spot and a bright spot and a dark spot. But that's antithetical to the night sky ordinance. And so at a minimum, I would say at least have them at every intersection and at the end of every cul-de-sac because you want people to see that, hey, there's an uh, obstacle ahead. Now, what you do in between is entirely a policy issue. Uh, Again, you're balancing different uh, competing interests. Yeah. There's, um, if you want to go see what they look like, Hunter's Crossing is done as, as the last bull on their intersections. Uh, they don't always have the in the call sec, but they've got them on the intersections. Go over to Pecan Park, it's completely random. I think somebody threw a dart at the map and where the dart landed, that's where the lights went in. So they're all over the place. Um, the new colony extension, they've already stuck in the street lights in there, and they're a mix of on the corners and mid block. But I think they're spread out to probably about four or five hundred feet. So you can, there's three different areas you can go look at and actually see what this looks like. We're, st we're still sitting on a 1,600 foot block min uh, maximum, right? No, actually that's gone away. It's We've gone, gone to a 2,000 foot that's block right. perimeter. Okay. Per that's so, perimeter. So more than likely it's going to be uh, a 1,000 foot block length at the very maximum. So if you're looking at that, you've got a maximum distance. You've got a light in one corner on each end. You're 1,000 feet. If you went 500 foot in the middle of the street, you're going to have one. Or at 200, you're going to have two lights in, the, in that block. I've got a thing in these. I'm, what, I'm, what I'm looking at is if we go with a 50-foot uh, lot width, basically for every four houses, you have a street light. It's kind of mm -hmm. how, yeah. how I'm looking at it and how, how if, you know, if my kids are walking down the street at night, you know, how many houses are they passing before they hit a street light? I feel like four is not that many. Like, I feel like we could probably go a little bit further out, but I also feel like um, 10 is, is, is a little bit too much. Too. <laughs> so I'm thinking like three or 400 feet makes a little more sense, probably at 300 foot range. Yeah, this is one of those things, I, I, when this came up, I started doing some research. I was looking to see, is there any standards out there for this stuff? No, there's not. I mean, every city's got their own idea, every jurisdiction. We're all over the map out there, and considering how many cities do this, you'd expect that somebody would have a standard and recommendations. I think the old FHA standard, which goes back to the 1950s, was about every 600 feet. But like you say, every other every city does things differently. So, so if you want to go more larger than 200 feet, I mean that's not. I mean again, that's a policy issue. That's not. I'm throwing 400 feet out there. Throwing it out there. I'm good with three to four. I can live with four. And then lastly, alternative pole heights and materials. Um, 
the pole heights are related to the separation and by going less you can probably go higher. Uh, and the nice thing about LEDs is they have a much better spread than the old uh, uh, high pressure sodium or low pressure sodium. Um, and like I said, I don't have a particular problem with um, poles other than galvanized steel as long as they're not wood. You know, they just don't throw up a, a telephone pole and attach a light on it. But any strong feelings one way or the other on that one? So with that, I think I'd like to turn it back over to you. And I know some of you had some additional issues or questions you might want to talk about. So I just want to clarify something real quick. So we're, we kind of made some decisions on a couple of things here, but are we still going to, um, on the tour, is he still going to kind of cover some of this stuff based on what, what we already have in place and come back and then say, okay, we changed our mind, we want to go to 700, you know what I'm saying? So I know we kind of said, yeah, we're good with three or four, and we've made a couple of little decisions, but I, I kind of almost feel like after we do this tour, we're going to come back and be in another situation where we want to change it again. You, we may very well. It's a draft until a day it's passed. Right. And I would envision that, you know, I will continue making changes and come back next month, and if you all want to make some more changes, you can, if you want to decide that's what you want to do, that's that's fine with me as well. David, one of, one of the comments is, I read it for the third time. There must, must be something wrong here. Um, one of the items that I notice is a lot of sentences, and I keep seeing this at the beginning, we say, here's our objectives. Mm -hmm. And I keep seeing that often repeated in various sections in the name of public health and safety. And I'm just wondering if we go through and reduce that type of redundancy, if we could shorten it, because even you said 150 pages is at least 50 pages too long for you. Is there ways we can go in and, and sh shrink this stuff down, maybe make some of the sections more concise, um, remove some of the technical how do you do it details and move those someplace else? Yeah, I can continue to keep working on it. Yeah, because I think, I think if we can get it down and get it so it's easy to read, um, I'm used to reading this stuff so I can figure it out, but I think not only should the, the developer be able to read it, but the citizens should be able to sit sure. down and read it and go, okay, I understand what we're trying to do here, and it's not an easy read. I understand. I think it was Mark Twain that said, I apologize for making it so too long. I didn't have time to make it short. You cover a lot of material. When you st we started this, I had no idea. I have learned a lot in six months reading through this thing and doing the research on it. Sue Ann, I know you had a lot of things that you brought forward. You want to make any comment? Actually, at this point, I'm not, um, I'm not quite sure what's appropriate and what isn't, or what's cogent. I'm not quite sure what's cogent and what isn't. What I had done was, um, with all of our diligence through this process was to realize that there are cities that are towns that are about our size that have experienced horrifically exponential growth and that perhaps we could learn from some of their experiences not as we could learn the easy way from looking at their experiences and what they had had to change in their ordinances and so I called, I, Kyle, Buda, and Hutto were the three cities, towns that I saw that had, I bet some of them are, I don't know now, 20,000 people. And so I started with Kyle and chatted with him and he uh, sent some information and the one I found most interesting was this ordinance 962, the thick one. And you'll feel that past the first three or four pages, first three pages, um, Will said that this is written as a handbook. So if a developer walks into to the planning department and says we're thinking about doing something in Bastrop, this this delinea it's an it's actually an appendix, and he pointed out that you can change an appendix without changing an ordinance. 
So it points out what the end goal is. So the developers aren't dealing with 150 pages, they're dealing with a big picture, which I would think that would be very productive for this community, considering what we will probably be facing from the standpoint of growth. And it may be completely irrelevant. I do know that Jennifer told me that um, they are set up in a totally different way, right? Right. And it's called? A Unified Development Code. Yes. And so I'm sort of curious. And you want to explain the difference between what we have and this Unified Development Code? Under Texas law, there is one enabling statute for zoning and one enabling statute for subdivision. And that's because the federal enabling acts were set up that way. So most cities have separate zoning, separate subdivision, and there's pros and cons either way. Some cities have made the leap to try to combine the two into a unified development code. We're all talking about development, so it ought to make sense. The issue sometimes comes up, though, is remember, subdivision is a ministerial process, and zoning is a legislative process. Well, if it's all in the same code, what applies? Uh, if you all want to make that jump to a unified development code, that's a completely different project. Um, but that's the difference. Also, the, this ordinance that you provided is from their zoning section, not their subdivision ordinance. And I don't disagree that having a simple uh, development manual where you know people understand what we're really talking about with a lot of graphics, I think would be a valuable thing to have. Underlying it, though, is a, a, a ordinance. And yeah, you can change the appendix, but the ordinance is what governs. Uh, do you happen to know what cities in this area have gone to the Unified Development Code? I don't. Jennifer may know. We can rattle off a few. Um, I definitely, um, Hutto does have a Unified Development Code. They've also smart coded most of their town, which is a type of a form-based code. So they've kind of done two different things in Hutto. Um, I know Buta just readopted, just updated, and did a major update to the Unified Development Code. I believe yeah, Kyle also has a Unified Development Code. Georgetown adopted their Unified Development Code in 2003, um, which is uh, right before I got there. Pflugerville and Round Rock, I believe, all have Unified Development Codes. So in this area, that has been the trend. I believe Marble Falls was just in the process of merging their, their two, um, so their subdivision and their zoning ordinance. They did a major update of, I think, the zone, the subdivision ordinance, and then they were doing an update and merging the two together into Unified Development Code. So there is a history in this area of doing that, but it is, it's a different scope than what we've been talking about. So um, what we were, you know, initially concerned about was the subdivision ordinance and updating that specifically, because they are still very different concepts of what you're talking about and different, um, you know, state state abilities that we have to do things. Would so. it be fair to say that updating this, then updating zoning, then updating whatever else, and so we have a good baseline before we thought about trying to combine them would be a good plan of action moving forward? Probably, yes. Okay. And I, I believe that the goal of also looking at our subdivision ordinance is to start developing more of those kind of appendices that, that provide the the how to do something without having to read in depth into the code. I believe that's that's going to be additional scope into um, what we're working with Matt on is to get more of that user friendly. This is what you need to do if you come in and you're trying to develop your C2 track. This is what you can do without having to read every line of the code. So. I I guess the question is how much of what. When we finish this process, how much of this would we uh, would become moot if we move toward a unified development code? All of these standards would still be within the unified development code. It would be a matter of formatting to so basically unified development code. Right now we have your, like our zoning code. We start with what are our districts, what where can you do very specific uses. And then our development standards, um, what does your site look like? Is it essentially taking three books and just putting them into it one? It is, and it's putting them into kind of a different order. So you start out with, you know, what are your processes? 
what are your residential codes? So all everything for residential land use and subdivision, like your lot standards, are all basically all in one section. Streets are all in one section. Drainage is all in one section. So it's kind of more by topic um, rather than just based on what we've process. done so far since the beginning of the year, I feel like if we tried to do it all at the same time, update it and bring it together, we'd be here for 36 months. Exactly. <laughs> it would, it was it was I, I, I think I think there would also be, have to be a lot bigger staff to take this on too simultaneously. That, that would that's that's true. So, so I think I think I think that's a good thought for down the line for you know okay. next round of appointments. And, and Jennifer mentioned uh, that uh, some of the cities had adopted uh, smart code. Or which is kind of a form-based code, and you know Matt Lewis. That's one of his approaches to to do form-based code, uh, that kind of thing. So when you talk to him on your field trip, you might uh, you know kind of feel him out about how he would approach that, which has some benefit of not traditional suburbia. It's it's creating what you're trying to do uh, downtown. And, Having said that, a lot of what I have in my design approaches for, you remember the, the city and the rural design approaches is a smart code approach. So I don't think that, you know, what he's going to propose is going to be uh, too contrary to what I, I proposed. There's uh, one, one other comment as I was looking at some of the other cities and stuff out there. Thank you that everything's in public domain. You can find it. But one of the items I noticed was as I went through these, they seem to have given a lot more leeway to their staff to make decisions. They said, here's kind of the end results and staff works out the details versus here's the details in the code. Um, we provide a lot of details in this draft that kind of says, here's what you're going to do. And the staff goes, yep, you did a check the box versus let's, okay, here's the objective. Mr. Developer, where you want to build, what are your options? Do these work out to address what the ordinance says? Um, but again, that, that's pushing a lot back onto the staff that we don't have right now. So uh, I'll be, go ahead. I was, I was gonna, I was gonna ask Cheryl if she went, wanted, you have some, some things that you wanted to see, huh? Yeah, I was just like, oh, you know what, I do have one thing I definitely want to talk about. Why don't you turn uh, on your mic? I do have one thing that I definitely want to talk about. We've touched on a lot of what I had sent in, but um, how, how could we incorporate um, the homeowners association or is that something that would go in this ordinance um, because a lot of the like the hundred percent maintenance bond couldn't that um, be or would that be able to be replaced by HOA because I know that they were very uncomfortable there were a lot of issues and concerns about it being a hundred percent and we bounced that number around um, but in the maintenance of the divisions, the new subdivisions that's going up, wouldn't an HOA cover a lot of that cost, including like you were talking about the snout um, and the garages being in the front and they get um, to where they're not maintained by the owner of the home, wouldn't the HOA, if we had an HOA or incorporated an HOA into this, resolve some of those issues? Well, two things. One, the maintenance bond is to cover the maintenance of the infrastructure that's built to make sure that if they build a street and it starts crumbling after the first freeze, that the contractor comes in and fixes. And I wouldn't put that on an HOA. And then after the two-year maintenance bond period ends, then it's the city's responsibility to maintain it. Again, other than being in the ETJ, uh, that wouldn't be a role for the HOA. Uh, you know, I don't know that the city has a whole lot. Yeah, I don't, the city doesn't want to be in a position of, uh, you know, regulating HOAs. I think the state legislature probably does too much <laughs> of that already. Uh, what we do have in there, though, is when you're creating common area properties or private streets or things that are privately owned but they need to be maintained, then we're just requiring that as part of the HOA that you have provisions for how you're going to pay for that, how it's going to be done. Um, yeah, I don't think the HOA is going, it, it, it doesn't affect the maintenance bond at all. Well, I'm just talking about HOA in, in general. So do we have, do any of these subdivisions have HOAs? Do we have, currently have HOAs? I'm sure you do. I'm not sure. Right. So is that part of the developers? 
The developers usually do that on their own. On their own. Yeah, it's not a city requirement. So um, I guess I was trying to figure out how the HOA could, um, the money from that could be used to maintain um, the look and the feel of the that, that's uh, kind of subdivision. Uh, the, the HOA's scope is to maintain the values of the properties by making sure that people like mow their grass, don't keep trash cans out, stuff like that. But other than finding somebody, there's not a whole lot of HOAs that have a lot of teeth because it costs a lot of money to go after somebody. So they can fine them and they can file those fines at the courthouse and when that house eventually sells, they can collect their money. But um, code enforcement is more kind of, that's their job responsibility. You know, somebody goes out there and says, hey, this is a, a health and safety hazard, do it or we're gonna, we're gonna make you do it. It's kind of more theirs. I, I think the HOA is not really set up to have a financial responsibility for anything inside their community other than maybe common areas that they accept. So um, as far as like maintenance and street like that, unless it's a gated community, you can't really compel them to do that either. So. Well, the way we've got it set up now is that if they do have a private, private it, it's community, private, but if it's, but if it's not private, it, then, right. then yeah. so like we couldn't go to the Hunter's Crossing HOA and say, look, you know, you guys have to do this, this, and this, and you have yeah. to maintain this, this, and this, because they're public streets, they're public sidewalks, yeah. you can go walk on it. I can somebody that's visiting town. So once it's public like that, you lose a lot of the city loses the ability to put that onto them as a private insti institution. Yeah, it was it person. was my initial question to Will was about maintenance of alleys because that's one thing that I've been concerned about and parks. He said that Kyle H HOA is required of every subdivision in Kyle, and that. The parks and public alleys are HOA maintained. And, yeah, you can do that. Or, and when we look at when we look at the fact that Bastrop is probably never going to have a major industry here to produce revenue for us, and it's going to probably become a bedroom community. And if we are burdened with all of these parks, because just from the development to the Northwest, I mean that uh, that's a lot of park area up there because it's flood flood plain. So, what happens to our what happens to to uh, supporting all those parks and all those alleys when actually there's not going to be sufficient income for it? So, I mean, I, basically. Is there some objection to requiring an HOA of every subdivision so that they can maintain their own parks? I think that de I think that depends. I think in your mind, when you say subdivision, you're thinking like Hunter's Crossing or Riverside mm -hmm. Grove, or that you can have a subdivision without having like a, you know, not like a planned development. You know, somebody like what they're doing off of uh, 21, where they've cut out some acreage, they've cut out the lots, and it's just a street and lots. It's, there's no other real amenities there. That's a technically subdivision too, but it's not a subdivision like we traditionally think of. Well, I'm assuming they're not going to have a park. Right. So I'm, I'm just saying. So when we say subdivision, just yes, clarify, we're talking, we're talking about, about like a planned development. Mm -hmm. A planned development. And if the HOA is responsible for maintaining the park, does that mean it's a private park and nobody else can use it? That would be. The I other. think we'll have to ask Kyle how they're handling that. It, An alternative to HOAs, so something Fort Worth does, instead of requiring an HOA, they require what's called a public improvement district, which is a quasi-governmental or organization that assesses an additional tax to cover the cost of maintaining the parks and amenities within that particular neighborhood. Okay, that's, and that's it's for that neighborhood. It's for that neighborhood. And it, it, the members are residents in that neighborhood. Yeah, there's not members. It's who the people within that uh, geographic area pay an additional tax. Hunter's Crossing is a, is a a property improvement district of PID. So the homeowners as well as the commercial businesses in there all pay an annual maintenance fee. Yeah, and no, that's separate from all the other city, on top of all the other I, city taxes. I would not use Hunter's Crossing as a good model of a PID. No, it's not a good model, but it, that's, it, I think that was the intent when they, right. but it's, its execution was flawed. Right. But that is, a good, that is a good point though, that if you, if you force the HOA to maintain it, it becomes a private. It becomes a private park. You know, the colony, for example. Even if the gates are open, you can't just go in there and swim at their pool and play on their, you know, tennis courts and stuff like that. It's, it's private, and so 
by doing that, you, you it's not public land, it's, it's private land. So, but what's the trade-off if, if the city is having to pay for it? It's not. It's just they could they could set up in the future if they wanted, where they said if you don't live here, you can't come use our park, which is right. Which is, the trade-off would be the, just, the trade-off would be that we wouldn't have to pay for it. The city wouldn't have to pay for it. Right, yeah. but it's but we also don't have city parks then. Well, I don't think a lot of people drive all the way out. I mean, we do have city parks I, I, we do I'm saying as, as the population grows the relative park space we have to that growing population will shrink if all the parks become private parks now the, the how that works out in the future and what how it looks is to be determined but that's the idea so it's, we don't want to have park space we have communities that have their own parks and if you don't live there then you can't go there um, which to me is not a real good Way to, to have I'm it looking. Up. I guess I'm kind of looking at it more from a cost perspective. I get the whole park thing. Uh, actually, if I lived in in one of the subdivisions, I wouldn't mind it being closed, uh, honestly. But um, from a cost perspective, if the city doesn't have to pay out to maintain the streets, that's covered by the HOA. Wouldn't that be been more beneficial to? No, because now you're talking about a gated community where you can't even drive on the streets over there. But it's uh, the parks and alleys. If, if the HOA is responsible for the streets, they're no longer public streets. The city doesn't have, it, you have to live there to drive on those streets. They could put gates up. They could deny you access. But, well, but the, but the, the parks and alleys. Yeah, the parks and alleys. Yeah, okay. is more yeah, what yeah, I was yeah we're just talking about the alleys. Yeah. That's different. That's I think a lot of this discussion is along the lines of what are we looking at for long-term costs? Because in the draft, we talk about the builder for so much acreage, he's got to dedicate something for parks or pay a fee, depending on how it works out for this. And I think the question is coming up is, okay, as we get our growth over the next decade or so, we're going to generate more of these parklands and more of these areas. Are we going to have enough revenue to take care of them? Where is the money going to come from? So we're, we're trying to, I think, get our arms around this. Is this the best way to do it, or is there a better way so that 10 years from now we aren't burdening well, Mastrop with a whole other set of maintenance cost? Parkland doesn't mean actual parks. It's just, I mean, it could it's, be it could be totally undeveloped. Doesn't require anybody to do anything. Open space. Yeah, 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 more of open space, like what they're doing. Um, Piney Creek. Yeah. Right, so, but if if it is, for instance, in a flood zone and it's not maintained and cleared, then the city becomes liable for right. any, and that's a whole other expensive issue. Yeah. I think, I think that's a valid point that we need to look at as we go forward, because however we put in here, we're setting something up for 10, 20 years from now. Um, is there going to be a cost that we're going to have to deal with, or is there a better way? We want parkland, we want open space for people, is there a better way to do it? HOAs are kind of one of these things that, that you have parks. I've lived in HOAs that have the gated community. We pay for the gate and we pay for all that road behind the gate too. When it needed to be repaved, we all pulled out our checkbooks. Jennifer? These are great items for future discussions. I was going to say, can, can one, one ever, whether it's next meeting or later, can you get with the city attorney and find out where, like if you're, if you're forcing a, a, a private organization like HOA to maintain parks and stuff like that, can you get with the city attorney and find out what the ramifications are of that and, and to what extent they can go? Because, I mean, kind of going off some baseline knowledge, but he would be the one to. Yeah, I will, I was, my commentary also on all of this listening to it is, and having worked in other communities where this has become a problem, where we had um, HOAs that owned their um, detention lots and their um, ponds, and they did not maintain them, and we spent a great deal of staff time having to get them to maintain their ponds correctly that were causing rat and mosquito problems, and HOAs that went defunct that now has no one to go to, to you're dealing with 200 homeowners, not an HOA. So there are downsides to HOAs that, um, Especially as you get 10, 20, 30 years out. So uh, I won't speak for anybody else. I'll just say my biggest question for the city attorney yeah, would be: but, Could an HOA mm -hmm. that's responsible for parkland or anything else ever, ever in the future, come in and say you can't use our park because you don't live here? I will ask. That. For me, moving forward, having yeah. lots of open space and parkland in our city is wonderful. It's not wonderful if the city's if the HOA started a trend where it's like you don't live here, you don't live here, you don't live here. 
get out of our parks because then we, we, we have a growing population and we're stuck with the park plan we have now and there's nowhere for that park plan to go. I mean, it's not gonna get bigger. You, you know, I think the real <laughs> bottom line is that request for a 20 year cost impact analysis and the cost of alleys and parks and that should give us some insight into the trade-off between having parks accessible to residents or all good things for future discussions <laughs> no I really thank you for bringing up some some things that we need to look at so my thank you for my, your work my proposal is to continue to make changes and if you have additional comments, send them to me through Jennifer, and I will incorporate those. And I will see you again next month. You're not coming Saturday? You're not going to come ride with me? I wasn't invited, but uh, Ooh. I actually... Ooh, man, I, I, that's I, cold. I, I actually have a commitment with my grandkids. Uh, yes. Oh, go for it. Commissioners, do you have any other comments? Any? Dave, David, thank you for the whole time in this. As I read through it, I could see all your little changes in the red line. Mm -hmm. I, I like this version in Word. I can see where they are. A lot of the things you had up there, I thought, yep, I saw that, saw that one. Thank you. Okay. All right, with that, I will close the workshop. And we will move on to item 6A. Does anyone have anything that they want to see on future agendas other than things we've already talked about? Yes, I think we need to start in the charter for the rules of the P&Z. It states an annual review of the comprehensive plan. Yes. And I'm, I didn't see the word transportation in there, but maybe that's when it's supposed to be, where we've got both of them, but we should probably put those on our agenda and start the review process. Okay. I'll do that. All right, thank you. Anything else? If not, we'll move on to item seven. Well, for, what is item seven? But, um, before okay. we adjourn, um, just to uh, remind you all, we do have the tour at nine to noon on Saturday. It, it starts and, le and returns to here, so meet here. Um, and then um, also, I think it might have gotten buried a little bit in the emails. We have a special meeting on August 15th, and we need to make at 6 p.m., and we need to make sure we have a quorum for that meeting. So. Is there anyone who cannot come to that meeting? And what's the, I, I, I'll be at that meeting. Okay, you, you already. I don't think I can be at that okay. meeting. Then we don't have a quorum. Well, we I don't know about Matt. Matt's not here today, so we we'll may not have a quorum. Matt. Yeah. So and um, the, the main emphasis on that will be to dis, I think that we're uh, to discuss the our moving forward on this uh, the subdivision ordinance. Will Mr. Our Lewis schedule. be here? Yes. Okay. Anything else? Now we'll move on to item seven. Motion to adjourn. Second. We're out of here. <laughs>